Hello and welcome everyone to this month's edition of the Retirement Power Hour. My name is Joe Alaria, and today we are coming to you with an updated version of our webcast on college savings and is a 529 really the best account type for your child. So today we're talking about five different account types, which we'll get into in just a moment, but uh, this will really help parents, new parents, uh, parents that have children that are getting ready to, to go to school, uh, to college. So we're going to cover a lot of uh, a lot of good information today. But before we jump into that, uh, as an introduction, I would like to share just a little bit about what we do here at Carson Area Wealth Management. And, uh, you know, if you don't know much about us, I would highly encourage you to go to our website, CarsonAlaria.com and check out our team. Everything we do, we have it, we do it with a team approach. We have a uh, a, a team of multiple advisors here who are experienced, credentialed, and we're fiduciaries for our clients. And we specialize in certain areas that allows us to, you know, we're, we're not generalists. So the, the type, the clients that we work with, we, we work with those specific types of clients on a regular basis. So whether it's uh, 50 and older medical professionals, business owners, those are the clients that we work with and we stay within those uh, boundaries. So we, we know what you're going through if you're fitting, fitting into those categories. And uh, we've got a, a small boutique style firm here. So we don't have a thousand plus clients per advisor. Uh, every advisor is going to be able to give every client their due attention. So there's my commercial. If you want to learn more about what we do, here are all of our services for the individual and the business side of, of what we do. So we, we also help small businesses, medium-sized businesses with their 401k plans. So check out carsonalaria.com and we've got a, a ton of information on all of these different services that, uh, that we provide. All right. Well, with that said, you know, I'm excited to talk about this topic today because I know that it is on so many of, of the parents' hearts to help their kids to help them uh, prepare for college, to help them financially. And I talk about it, you know, on, on a regular basis with, with clients and prospective clients that have children that are, you know, in this phase of their lives. So we want to give you a couple of things to think about today. So we're, we are going to talk about the 529 plan. The 529 plan is certainly, I would, I would say it's the most popular type of account when you're talking about helping your children. It's a 529 college savings plan. We'll talk more about that, but we also want to talk about some other options. Just again, to give you some things to think about because you might find that a 529 is, is not the best for you. Now, we're not here to advocate for any of these things, any of these account types over you know any of the others. We just want to make sure that, that you're aware and you're educated on the best account type for you which is going to depend on your goals. So we're going to talk about 529s, UTMAs, parent-owned brokerage accounts, parent-owned Roth IRAs, and custodial Roth IRAs today. So, of course, we're going to kick it off, and we're going to start with the 529 college savings plan. So it's called a college savings plan, but in reality, now a 529 plan can be used for private K-12 through tuition, apprenticeships, student loan payments. Uh, so you can use it for other things rather than, you know, just traditional college tuition. Um, now, one of the, the benefits of using a 529 is you get some, some positive tax treatment. And we'll, we'll start talking on a federal level, and then we'll talk on the state level as well. So on the federal level, your contributions are made on an after-tax basis, which means you don't get a deduction on a fed on the federal level but the earnings are not taxed and then qualified withdrawals can be taken tax free and we'll talk about what a qualified withdrawal is in just a moment there's no contribution limit federally uh, to 529s we'll talk more about that but, um, but when you move to the state level Many states allow for deductibility of contributions, Illinois and Missouri. You know, geographically, that's where we're at on the border of Illinois and Missouri. So both Illinois and Missouri do allow for uh, deductions on contributions to 529 plans. 
most states impose a limit somewhere between 350,000 and 500,000 on on contributions and we just have to be aware of gift tax implications if if we're saving anything above $15,000 a year per person <clears throat> uh, for example you know Illinois does allow deductibility for up to 20,000 per year that's for married filers though 10,000 for single filers so if you have a a husband and a wife that each want to give you know 10,000 essentially you're under the gift tax exemption amount here in 2021 so there's nothing to worry about there and you get to deduct up to 20,000 in Illinois so another benefit is there's no income limits. So you can't make too much money that will prevent you from saving to a 529 or contributing. And uh, your, the beneficiaries can change within the family if you have multiple children and the first doesn't need the 529, you could change it to, the, to your next child or even to yourself if your children end up not, not going to college, not needing the funds, you can, and you, decide to go back to school, you can change it to yourself. Um, you know, and I, I've actually had that happen before with uh, one of my clients who went back to school and, uh, and used the 529. So it's, it does happen. So those are, those are some of the benefits. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I also just want to mention that contributions can essentially be made. It is actually on here by multiple people. So it doesn't have to be just mom or dad. It could be grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncles, uh, aunts and uncles. And friends, family members, it really doesn't matter. <clears throat> um, anyone can contribute for the benefit of your child. And that would be, that would be awesome if, that, if you did have a bunch of people contributing. So on the withdrawal side, what is a qualified withdrawal? Well, um, or a qualified expense rather. So if you want to get the money out of the 529, it has to be qualified or else a 10% penalty will apply. So qualified expenses would include tuition and related fees, uh, room and board, technology, books and supplies. Um, you know, some of the pretty typical things that, that you'd run into if you're going to a university. Now for room and board, as it says, you have to be half time or more and uh, the university will set the off-campus room and board budget. Um, so, you know, there's, there's some things to be aware of here, but in, in general, these are the things that, that you can use uh, to pay, use a 529 to pay for. Now, what about a scholarship? And I get this question, you know, every once in a while, or people will just say, and not even ask, they'll just say, well, I don't wanna use a 529 because if my kid gets a scholarship, then that money is just wasted. And I think they're gonna get a scholarship. Well, <clears throat> that's actually not 100% not true because if your child gets a scholarship, then you as the owner of the 529 can withdraw up to the amount of the scholarship. You'll avoid the 10% penalty on that, but the withdrawal will be taxable. So the, um, the earnings that you made will be taxable. So a scholarship's not going to hurt you per se. And, you know, if you get a scholarship, you're obviously saving a lot of money. So I wouldn't think that's a reason to not use a 529. Okay. Um, but in general, we're, we're going to talk about a few themes here. And the themes are control, right? So who has control of the account? And in, in this case, a 529, you, the parent, if you're setting up the 529, you get control of the account. You're the owner. Your child is the beneficiary. So the child does not get to decide when to spend the money. You get to decide. Now it has to be for qualified expenses, but there's no concern about your child pulling the money out, um, you know, and spending it on something else, even when they become an adult. The other thing is flexibility, flexibility in use, flexibility in, in uh, you know, what you use the money for, when you use it. So again, the, the upside here is that you get some tax benefits with a 529. The downside is you have to use a 529 for specific things or else you'll pay a penalty. So there's not as much flexibility, but that's typical when you're getting these tax benefits. But control is one thing that we'll continue to look at. So let's look at the second biggest, uh, second type of account that you could use to help your children financially. And that would be the UTMA account. 
So this is a custodial account that is, you know, it's for the benefit of your child, but it is controlled by the parent until the child reaches the age of majority. Okay. There is no designated purpose for the UTMA, meaning it doesn't have to be used for education. There are no rules around what it can be used for. It can be used for anything. Um, so there's complete flexibility in use, but the control here will go to your child when they, when they do hit the age of majority. So you're in control until they become an adult and then they're in control. And so that's a big thing to think about here. If you are concerned about your child and, and how they might choose to spend that money. So maybe you're not primarily concerned about helping with college and you want to provide your child with more flexibility in how they use the funds. Maybe you'd like to, you know, maybe you're thinking they can use it for a wedding. They can use it for a down payment on a house, something like that. And you don't want them to be boxed in to using it for college education. Well, beware that uh, you could have the best intentions. And with an UTMA, when they hit the age of majority, they can take it all out and buy a, you know, nice uh, brand new fancy car or, you know, go, go gamble it away at the casino if they wanted to, because they're going to be in control even if that's all your money that went in there and you started the account. <clears throat> um, now, there's no annual contribution limit for an UTMA, but again, gift tax considerations will apply. So you want to make sure you are aware of the annual gift tax exemption amount. And you can give up to that amount each year. It's around 15000 right now. Uh, you can give up to that per parent with, with no tax consequences, essentially. So you know, that's a pretty fair amount of, at least in, in most cases I've witnessed. And then uh, lastly, but utmost, you know, they can make it more difficult to, for the child to qualify for a financial aid. So that's another big thing. If you're planning to, to get some financial aid, utmost can make that a bit more difficult. So you have, you have flexibility, doesn't have to be used for education, but that control piece is a little bit it could be concerning for certain parents. If, if, those, if you're concerned about how your child might spend the money, then this might be a concern. And, and then uh, we have one more point. Obviously, it's less tax advantageous. So in an UPMA, you don't get those tax benefits of a 529. This is a taxable account. So that means that your, your money goes in after tax. You are taxed every year on dividends and interest. And then as you sell any, any positions that are up, you may have capital gains that you have to pay taxes on. So it's a taxable account. There, there's no tax benefits, uh, and that's why you get the flexibility. There tends to always be a trade-off. Uh, one thing, though, I, I did want to point out, the first $2,100 of unearned income in, uh, you know, for the child is, is maybe tax-free, but anything over that would be subject to the parent's tax rate. So while this isn't as friendly from a tax perspective, I usually would you know, tell clients, these accounts, <clears throat> they don't tend to be very large. Now they might be, you might just be throwing a bunch of money in there uh, for your child's benefit. So you know, it could be that they, they are large accounts, but in a lot of cases, there might be a few thousand dollars in there. So the, the taxes, that these accounts are spitting off are not typically very high. So just keep that in mind. It is a taxable account, but the taxes may not be very high. But you also need to be aware of where the parent's tax rate is. If you can control and make sure that the unearned income is below 2100, uh, great, because then you're going to be not paying any tax on that. So we've got the 529, we've got the UTMA. And the third type we're going to talk about is a parent-owned brokerage account. So what's, what's a parent-owned brokerage account? Well, it's just a brokerage account. It's, it's, a, it's an individual account or a joint account that's owned by you, the parent, or you, the, the parents, you know, with, with your spouse. So it's just a taxable account. It's, it's fully controlled by you. You have full flexibility in how you use it, when you use it. I would say this is the least tax advantageous. Uh, because now you, the parent, are taxed on capital gains, interest, dividends each year, and it's at the parent's tax rate. Um, so again, 
The implications of these accounts, I just said it could be minimal if the accounts have a small balance. So just keep that in mind. There's no annual contribution limit, but you're going to have those same gift tax considerations. Um, now, it's important to understand here that when you save into the account, you're not gifting any money to anybody. So you are not gifting anything when you put money in. So the gift tax considerations don't apply there. But when you pull the money out, gift tax considerations would apply uh, if you pull it out and then give it to your child, right? If you just pull it out and you don't give to your child, well, then there's no gift tax because you're not gifting it. But if you pull the money out and then gift it to your child, there could be gift tax considerations that you want to be aware of there. So there's no annual contribution limit, no income limits. You can make any amount of money and, and still use a parent-owned brokerage account. Multiple people could essentially, you know, contribute, you know, to this type of account as well. So, um, you know, oops. And, and when we talk about control and flexibility, that that's the thing to think about here is this is the ultimate account for flexibility. You get very limited uh, tax benefits here, but you can use the account however you want. And really this, I, I call this uh, the, the control freak account. This is for the parents out there that say, you know what? I want to retain control until I don't want to. So my child's not ready to use this money. Um, so I'm going to retain it. And then, you know, if things go well, if they are doing all the things we want them to be doing, Maybe at that time, I'll choose to pull some money out here. But until then, no, it's it's my money. It's just maybe sep separated in, a, in its own account, earmarked for the benefit of my child or my children. Uh, so I actually, you know, I, I have an account like this for my, my kids because I am a little bit of a control freak. But again, I'm not ad, uh, advocating to do this over the others. But just explaining that um, in, in my situation, I valued flexibility for the end use at, at this time right now, my kids are incredibly young at this moment when, as I'm recording this. So uh, that may change and I may start using a 529 this year, who knows, but this type, this strategy will give you the max flexibility, I think out of all of these, but it's going to give you the least amount of tax benefits. So you really need to, to be aware of that. Um, but it is an option. It is an option. Okay. So the next one, parent-owned Roth IRA. So again, what is a parent-owned Roth IRA? It's just a Roth IRA that you own. And uh, why would you do this? So we're talking about trying to help your kids. Why would you open a Roth IRA in your own name? It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Well, you know, if you've ever been on an airplane um, and they go through the instructions at the beginning, they tell you that if you're traveling with a child, and the masks fall down, put your own mask on first and then help your child. And that's how I think of this strategy. This is the airplane oxygen mask strategy. Put your, Save for yourself first if you feel that you might be at risk of being behind and not where you need to be. Save for yourself first and then you can reevaluate. Make sure you're taken care of and then you can assist with your child because, you know, if you are behind and you, you do all this saving for your child and you don't save enough for retirement, you can't get a loan for retirement. No one's going to, you know, give you a loan to, to help you pay your bills. You're probably going to end up having to move in with your kids anyway, which uh, I don't know if that's what you want or what they want. You don't want to be in that position. You don't want to be, you know, running out of money later in life because you're going to have to take care of yourself. Your kids can get a loan for school. You know, and it may not be what you want, but they can get a loan and you can help them pay that loan off over time. But at least you have flexibility, especially if you have young kids save, you know, if you're not saving anything, save to your Roth IRA first. When, when 15 years goes that goes by, uh, reevaluate it at that time. And then if you're, if you're ahead of, of where you think you need to be, then you can say, all right, now we can kind of use this, this Roth IRA. And yes, you can use your Roth IRA to help your children with college. So number one, um, anyone can withdraw their contributions to, to the Roth IRA. You can withdraw those out at any time for any reason 
without a penalty and without tax, because those are contributions that have already been taxed. So you can take those back out. Now, what you can't take out is the growth on those contributions, unless you're 59 and a half and, and you've had the account open for at least five years. Uh, if you do it at that point, now it's taxed and there's a 10% penalty on the earnings. So you can use it, you know, um, you can pull it out and use it for any reason. If, if you have no other money saved up, um, you, you would be able to tap your Roth IRA. So to contribute to a Roth though, you need to be under certain income limits. So you have to look those up, um, you know, based on if you're married or if you're a single filer. So if you make too much money, essentially you can't use a Roth IRA. The contributions have to be made with earned income. You have to have earned income to contribute to a Roth IRA. So that's something to be aware of. Um, so if you're retired, for example, and you don't have earned income and you're living off your investments or some other means, then you can't contribute to a Roth IRA. Maybe you're living off of passive income uh, from real estate. You can't contribute. That's not earned income. Annual contribution limit of $6,000 per year or 7,000 if you're 50 and older. And these are 2021 limits. So again, you do have the potential for tax-free, penalty-free withdrawals of your cost basis at the time the child goes to college. Um, and then you could, you could even get exceptions for you know, taking out if you are going to use it and can prove that you're using it for college uh, expenses, then there are exceptions to a, a few further exceptions to the 10% early withdrawal penalty. So it's not, not a terrible option. Uh, the last option is a custodial Roth IRA. So a custodial Roth IRA is a Roth IRA that essentially is owned by your child, but it's a custodial account. You control it until your child becomes an adult. And as I have here, this could be a good option if college savings is not your primary objective, but you do want to help your child financially. So I don't know that it may not be you, but if it's, if that sounds like it might be you, then this could be a really good option for you. So a parent can contribute to the child's Roth IRA, but the child must have earned income. So this might be a summer job or, you know, even services done around the house for a reasonable fee. You got to speak to a, a tax specialist on this. You got to do a good job documenting this. But um, if the child has earned income, then they can contribute up to 6,000. If they make 6,000 a year, they can contribute $6,000 to a Roth IRA. And this is 2021 limit. So that could change. And then of course you get the tax-free growth, tax-free withdrawals on the earnings and contributions at 59 and a half. And you got to follow all the other Roth IRA rules, but this could end up being the most impactful strategy of all the strategies that we've talked about. If your child ends up leaving the money in the Roth IRA, until they retire. Because if you think about it, it's just compound interest and time. And when you, let's say you put money in the Roth IRA for your child when the child's 15, 16, 17, 18, and they're, they're working. Imagine that they keep that money in that account for 50 or 60 years. You know, they, they pull the money out when they're in their late sixties or they're even their late seventies. And just your, your couple thousand dollar contribution could amount to hundreds of thousands of dollars with all of that time, if it's invested, you know, properly and prudently, it, it could, the, the compounding on that is, is, is much more impactful than any other strategy we've talked about because it's such a longer term strategy. And uh, as I said here, the child could still make withdrawals of contributions during college years with no penalty, no taxes if needed. Uh, certain uh, ex exclusions or exceptions to the 10% could apply when using this for college. So we talked about the 529, great tax benefits, not a lot of flexibility. We talked about the UPMA, you've got a lot of flexibility, not a lot of tax benefits. The, the parent-owned brokerage account, you retain full control, right? As opposed to the UPMA where you're going to give up control at some point. The fourth option is that parent-owned Roth IRA, which obviously you're still in full control but um, you know it's not ideal 
to to use for your children's benefit, but it's you got to take care of yourself first. And then the last but not least, this custodial Roth IRA. And again, so who's in control of the custodial Roth IRA? Well, you are until your child becomes an adult, then you're not. So the child could take the money out when they become an adult and pay a penalty on it, um, which wouldn't be wise at all. But hopefully they're, you, you know, you're counseling them. And, uh, and if you're our client, then you know that we'll gladly help uh, counsel your children as well to, to help them make good decisions with their money. And then I, I had to throw this one in as well. This is not something that I can, would consider a good option for college savings, but unfortunately I hear about it pretty, pretty, pretty frequently. And that is whole life insurance. Um, and, and I'm just going to be direct. This has to be one of the worst options I've ever heard for college savings. And I'll explain right now. First of all, whole life insurance is a life insurance contract that has a cash component to it. The cash can grow over time. I'm not saying that all whole life insurance is bad. What I'm saying is that whole life insurance is a terrible option for college savings. And uh, often these policies, when you, you know, and I've seen plenty of them, but it often takes 10 to 15 years to break even on the cash value versus what you paid. So that means I'm paying premiums for 10 to 15 years. And after 10 to 15 years, and you need to, uh, this is not all policies, you need to run an illustration, you need to review illustrations um, and, and your specific scenario and situation. I'm just telling you in general what I have seen before, 10 to 15 years to break even. So, so after 10 to 15 years, my money hasn't, hasn't grown, or I should say at that break even point, your money hasn't grown at all. You just, you just have cash value equal to what you put in. And, and so forget growth. You know, it takes that long to just have a cash value equal to what you even put in. If, if you use any of the options that we talked about, your break even point is immediately. You immediately have the cash, cash value equal to what you put in, any of those previous options. So, you know, I just don't see how whole life makes a lot of sense. Plus you're talking about conservative growth rates expected after that break even. So, you know what, you're, you probably have 15 to 20 years for this money to grow. And if it takes 10 to 15 years to break even, then you have five to maybe 10 years of, of growth. And, and we're talking conservative growth rates. And I think anyone, any life insurance agent who, who recommends and sells a lot of whole life, I think has to be honest and, and say that, you know, whole life is not a replacement for stock growth, but more, more, it's more commonly compared to bond growth. And so that's conservative, you know, those are conservative growth rates that we would expect after that break even, which takes so long to get to. And then when you do take withdrawals, they're either taken as a loan that has to be paid back or would be taken as a partial surrender, which could come with surrender charges. I mean, you have to look at the contracts, but you know, I just, I, I cannot see any reason uh, to use whole life as a tool for college savings, but don't worry if you've, if you've been sold a product, a bill of goods, you know, we can, we can talk through it. We can help you evaluate it. And there might be a way for you to make adjustments and kind of, um, you know, cut your losses potentially, but that's something you need to have reviewed. If you're sitting on a whole life policy right now that was sold to you for, as a way to save for college. Cause I just think there are better ways out there. All right. Well, I was, uh, I didn't hold back on that last one, but I hope this was helpful. We covered those five account types and we do have a blog on our website. So if you go to carsonalaria.com, you can read more about all of these different options that you might have. And the biggest thing is if you're at this point where you need to make a decision and you don't know which way to go, this is just an introductory uh, method for you to learn a little bit, but reach out to us. We'll give you a free retirement assessment. We'll give you a free uh, assessment on how to help your kids financially. But, you know, we are here. We, we do offer that. Um, so there's no obligation to you. Reach out via email or phone. My email is on the screen. Our phone number is on our website. It's, it's also, I'll give it to you here, 618-288-9505. 618-288-9505. And I very much appreciated uh, the opportunity today to go over this and stay tuned because every month we present the Retirement Power Hour, the last, usually the last Thursday of every month. 
And uh, so that's what we'll continue to do. But if you miss these webcasts, go to carsonalarea.com, go to our resources tab. If you look at webinars, they are all sitting there for you to go back and watch again. Just have to register and you can watch every single one of them if you'd like. And we cover a lot of different topics. So if you have any ideas, things you'd like to see covered, feel free to reach out and don't forget to share, share, share with your friends, with your family, anyone who might get value out of these webcasts. With that, we covered a lot of material. So thanks for watching if you're still with me and I hope to hear from you, talk to you soon. And I hope you can join us on our next month's edition of the Retirement Power Hour. Thank you all very much and have a great day.